So I just want to welcome everybody. And uh, for those of you who don't know me, I am Sarah Yassine. I'm a Maryland district leader for the Humane Society of the United States. Um, sorry. I want to welcome you to this presentation on how to prosecute and hold people accountable for animal abuse. Um, I'm grateful that you chose to spend the evening with us. We have a lot of information to share tonight. Um, our primary goal is to exchange information with those on the front lines who prosecute people who abuse the animals that we all care about. Um, I firmly believe that as animal advocates, collaboration is the best way to achieve our ultimate goals of protecting animals. We are joined today by two distinguished individuals, the state's attorney of Montgomery County, John McCarthy, and Carlotta Woodward, who wears two hats. She is the chief of the juvenile division of the state's attorney's office and is the lead prosecutor of all animal abuse cases in Montgomery County. So please feel free to ask questions in chat. And uh, I just wanna remind yourself that you're to mute yourself. And um, um, I also wanna let you know that this uh, presentation is being recorded. So it is now my pleasure to introduce um, Montgomery County State's Attorney, John McCarthy. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Uh, I, I, thank you for uh, the introduction tonight. And also just thanks for helping us get organized here tonight. Uh, to make this presentation about a topic I think that everybody that's here joining with us has, has a mutual interest in, and that's how can we can, working together, protect better the animals that we love out in our community. Uh, I'm here tonight with, with Carlotta Woodward. Um, uh, Carlotta Woodward uh, does wear two hats for me, but tonight primarily uh, I've asked Carlotta to come, and uh, she's actually going to be the primary uh, present presenter here this evening. Because for many, for many years, Carlotta has been heading uh, the prosecution and the investigation of animal, animal abuse cases here in Montgomery County. Now, I know that there may be some listeners that are not from Montgomery County. We are a suburban jurisdiction outside of Washington, D.C. We're fairly lar large, over a million people. But we are actively engaged in protecting the animals that live in this community. And the person that's taken on that role is Carlotta Woodward, who volunteered for this job. I, I think this is or a passion that she has. And I think it's really important to have someone that's passionate about protecting our animals doing this. Uh, for any of you who are from Montgomery County, if you went to Woodward High School, that was named after Carlotta's great grandfather. And uh, before I, I get into my own preliminary remarks, I will say to you, uh, I'm very proud of Carlotta. Uh, she's recently been nominated to be a judge here in, in, in Montgomery County. The governor hasn't made a selection yet, but uh, if she becomes a judge, she will be the fourth member of her family, her great grandfather, her grandfather, her father, and then herself here in Montgomery County who have served the people of Montgomery County from the bench. Uh, I have an unreliable authority, uh, the, the superb, now retired chief judge of the Court of Special Appeals, uh, Patrick Woodward. Her father is in attendance tonight, so a special welcome to uh, Judge Woodward, uh, who can be a wonderful advocate for us uh, here in the community. So. Having said that, uh, let me talk, what are we gonna do here tonight? Uh, let me just very quickly oh. take you through uh, some of the vital areas that Sarah indicated uh, that we would be discussing. And again, as Sarah indicated, we'd be asking all of you to join us in the chat. If you have questions, we'd be happy to take them at the end of the presentation. We're gonna review first, just the number of cases to tell you how active we've been here in Montgomery County in terms of the number of cases uh, uh, that we've actually prosecuted where we filed charges against individuals. Uh, we're gonna review five primary statutes that exist in Maryland. These are statewide statutes. I know some of you may be in other jurisdictions. I'm aware that that could possibly be true. I think the vast majority of our audience are people that are here from Montgomery County, I'm sorry, from Maryland. And we'll be talking about the elements and the penalties for those crimes. Uh, we're going to talk about the differences between felony and, and uh, misdemeanor charges as relates to animal abuse. Uh, we're also going to talk about, and this is where I think we, we can really help each other. We have challenges in the practical day-to-day -day of prosecuting these cases with getting our expert witnesses in there, proving intent, dealing with defendants that may have mental health issues or might be have poverty issues where 
uh, financial resources may be and have an interplay in what happens with the animals. But uh, again, besides the basic animals, animal rights statutes, we're also going to talk about very specific uh, crimes like dog fighting and cock fighting. And look, we, we are, you know, we're right up against Washington, D.C., but I will tell you, is there dog fighting in Montgomery County? Have we prosecuted those cases? Yes. Are there cock fighting cases in Montgomery County? Have we prosecuted those cases? Answer yes. I think that would be surprising to some people. Uh, we're going to talk to you also about what powers we have. What can we do to investigate these cases so that when we get to court, we're very effective. We're going to talk about search warrants and photographs and, and the subpoena powers we have to make the best case possible uh, in, in our prosecution. Uh, we're going to talk about the vital role, and I'm, I know Carlotta is going to talk about this, the vital role of experts. These cases all involved expert witnesses, and you are probably familiar with the, the wonderful vets that are out there in the community, and I think Carla is going to speak about some of the vets that she works with here in the prosecution of the cases here in Montgomery County. How do we dispose of these cases? What can, you know, what should we expect? What's going to happen? What's the end game going to be? if the case comes into court as a felony or a misdemeanor. Uh, uh, Carlotta is also gonna talk about some, briefly, about a series of cases that we dealt here in Montgomery County uh, and, and tell you some of the stories associated with some of the animals that we've helped save, rescue, or you know, make safe. Uh, again, if you have a question uh, during the course of this presentation, please put it in chat. We will come back to those questions at the end and try to answer any questions anybody has here today. So uh, with that having been said, uh, it is my great honor to, to introduce uh, a wonderful ad animal advocate, uh, the head of my juvenile division, and the woman who is the lead prosecutor in all these animal cases in my county, uh, Carlotta Woodward. I turn it over to you, Carlotta. Thank you so much, Mr. McCarthy, and thank you everybody for being here. Um, to hear this presentation, ask questions, kind of see what we do here in the state's attorney's office. I'm extremely lucky to have Mr. McCarthy as the state's attorney in Montgomery County. He has given me this opportunity to follow a passion that I love um, and expand it. And uh, he's extremely supportive uh, of our endeavors that we do here in prosecuting these cases for our voiceless victims. So, in all of these slides, I kind of have pictures, so I'm going to tell little stories, but I'm going to go through and kind of talk about what we do here and some of the cases. So first of all, this is Sox. For those that you were on, um, Ms. Yassine was talking about this. This was my baby that I had that passed away in December of 2018. He was thrown away um, on the side of a major road in Virginia, um, and my brother-in-law picked him up but was unable to keep him, so we brought him up to my house where I had him for approximately about three years, where unfortunately he passed away from cancer in December of 2018. But that's my baby, one of my babies that I've had. And so just a little bit to kind of show the amount of cases that we have kind of dealt with since 2014 through to the present, which is the present of June of, or July of 2021. Um, these are the type of cases, the amount of cases that we deal with here in the office that I personally have handled. But this does not encompass all of the investigations that I um, deal with through animal services here in Montgomery County in order to determine if charges are appropriate in those particular cases. Um, but these are the amount of cases that we see per year. As you can see, some years, are, there are more cases. Um, this year we are at 17, but there are more coming through that I am aware of. Like I said, one of the things that I take pride in um, and that I'm lucky with Mr. McCarthy giving me this ability is that we are the voices for animals. We are voices for those that are voiceless. This is Poseidon. Poseidon is a beautiful German shepherd that was kicked down the stairs by his original owner and broke its leg. Officers um, were called out to the animal hospital in which this particular individual dropped this dog off. One of those officers fell in love with this dog 
and adopted it. And this is Poseidon and he is doing extremely well. He does have screws in his leg because of the surgeries that had to happen because of what that owner did to this particular dog. So Mr. McCarthy talked really about kind of what we're gonna, what I'm gonna cover today, kind of the statue. So I just wanna give everybody an idea of what uh, is required and uh, um, through having to prove these cases criminally. Um, and obviously I'm gonna show how we prosecute these cases and some examples. Um, Oliver was rescued in North Carolina um, from a negligent owner in which this baby was extremely underweight, almost at death had fleas, and now it is a happy, healthy, fat little girl. Um, and Charlie and Allie are one of my paralegals, two dogs, and they're just spoiled. So I put them on the screen. So in our office, in the state's attorney's office, we have the, obviously a dedicated prosecutor who is myself. And currently we are training another prosecutor to come on board to help me with these cases as these cases are um, extremely time consuming. Um, they take a lot of investigation and it takes a lot to prosecute these cases as well as dealing with animal services and deciding charges on other cases. So Mr. McCarthy has given the authority to have a second prosecutor in which I am currently training right now to help in handling of these extremely serious cases. So this is Zeus. Zeus was found wandering in the streets of Silver Spring, had been dumped um, by its owner. Um, that same officer that you saw that had adopted Poseidon found Zeus at the same time and adopted Zeus as well. So he adopted two animals that had been abused and neglected. And they, as you can see, Zeus is very healthy to this day. So I wanna talk about mainly a lot of the cases that we see are what we call misdemeanors. And it comes under the statute 10604, which is abuse or neglect of an animal. And typically these cases are cases in which owners or custodians have failed to provide necessary um, substance, necessary vet care, air, space, shelter, things of that nature. Um, for their animals. These are typically the cases that we see um, come through. Um, and they are what I consider what we call criminally negligent. It is such a negligence that rises to the level of being charged with a criminal offense. And it can include overdriving or overloading an animal. And specifically, if you inflict unnecessary pain and suffering on an animal. I can tell you that in reading this, some of it seems very easy to understand as to necessary vet care or proper drink or what, what is proper space for dogs? What is proper space for a cow? Um, so one of the things that we have to do is be able to prove what proper air is, what proper shelter is in, in the veterinary world because everybody has different ideas as to what is appropriate for specific animals. So these are the type of cases that I deal with when owners or custodians of animals are very neglectful and abusive to animals in, that rise to the level of being criminally charged. These cases, the penalties for each charge is only 90 days in jail and or a fine of $1,000. And I say that because that means that these cases originate in district court and they remain in district court. As a condition, if somebody is convicted of this, they are able to, the court can require them to participate in or pay for psychological counseling, as well as require them to pay all reasonable costs that were incurred by the removal of that animal, the housing, the treating, and unfortunately, in some cases, the euthanasia of an animal that has been confiscated based upon the animal cruelty component. Ultimately, a lot of the cases um, that are not misdemeanors, they turn into felony cases. And under 10606, it's called the aggravated animal cruelty case or aggravated animal cruelty charges. And what this means is, is that a person cannot intentionally mutilate an animal, torture an animal, 
cruelly beat an animal, cruelly kill an animal, or engage in sexual contact with an animal. These cases have what is called the intentional component. And that is, as a prosecutor, I'm required to prove that this was an actual intentional act against the animal, that the animal, that this individual intentionally mutilated or intentionally killed or intentionally tortured. And one of the things that we see as issues um, in prosecuting these cases are defining some of these terms, such as torture. So for me, I have a definition of what I believe that torture is to an animal, as probably you do. A lot of other people may have differences in opinions as to what torture is. And I can tell you that across the country, there is a differing opinion or definition as to specifically what torture means. Um, to me, uh, holding a dog up by a leash where it cuts off the air and could potentially cause asphyxiation to me is torture. To other people, it is not torture. So one of the things that we grapple with specifically with torture is how do we prove that when there's no real definition of it, there's no case law on it for me to follow, and everybody may interpret things differently. Now, obviously, cruelly killing an animal, I think that's, we all can agree what that is, mutilation of an animal, but then even when you get to cruelly beating, what is that, how does that rise to that level of cruelly beating an animal? There is no definition as to that. So it really depends on your facts and circumstances of your case, as well as I rely heavily on my vets and my vets can tell me whether they believe that this would have been a torturous act towards an animal. Um, and so I have to rely upon their testimony in order to be able to prove these type of cases. But the interesting thing is, is I always have to prove the intent that this person specifically intended to commit this act on this animal, not that it was by accident, which is a different level of prosecution than the 10604, which I had explained earlier. The penalty for this is three years of potential incarceration. So if you cruelly kill an animal, the maximum that you could receive in jail is three years and or a fine not exceeding $5,000. Again, we can get reasonable costs for the care of an animal. Obviously, if an animal is deceased, it could go to the necropsy, which is a autopsy of an animal. Um, we can also get psychological counseling, and we obviously can get the prohibition of owning, possessing, or really having control over an animal for the period of time um, that a person may be on probation or incarcerated. So one of the things that I think I found very interesting, and whenever you think about dog fighting, I think everybody can say we think about Michael Vick, right? Or at least I do. Um, and thinking about that I grew up here in Montgomery County, I grew up here in Rockville, I, I never thought I would see anything with respect to dog fighting. Um, and it happens. And I successfully prosecuted a dog fighting ring here in Montgomery County. And so one of the things that we have is 10607, which is an aggravated cruelty to animals. And this is dealing with certain activities related to dog fighting. And that's dealing with if you arrange or conduct a dog fight, if you use or allow a dog to be used in a dog fight or for baiting. If you train a dog with the intent to use it in a dog fight, if you allow the premises to be used, all of these is a criminal charge. Um, it's not as easy to prove because you really have to prove that that particular individual has been engaging in these particular activities. So you have to do a, a number of evaluations in the cases and determining, can I really prove that this was a dog fighting operation? Or can I prove that this individual was actually training this dog to dog fight? Because a lot of things that you will see that implements that they use are actually used in a normal course of having an animal. This particular charge carries a maximum of three years in prison and a fine not exceeding $5,000. Again, we're able to do psychological counseling, prohibit 
an individual from owning or possessing or having control over an animal, as well as paying any reasonable costs associated with the housing um, of that animal or you know, medical treatment, things of that nature. So this is where I talk about the implementations of dog fighting. So as you can see, I have put up kind of pictures so that you could kind of see what these are. And 10607.1 is a crime and it is the implementations of dog fighting. And it is an implement of dog fighting means an implement, an object, a device, or a drug intended or designed to enhance the fighting ability of a dog or for the use or for use in deliberately um, conducted event that uses a dog to fight with another dog. So these are examples, as you can see a fighting pit. I'm sure everybody can understand what a fighting pit is. Well, a spring pole, that's where they're training, they're strengthening the dog's jaw muscles and neck for the fighting so that they can grasp down and kill, bite the other dog. So as you can see, the training of pulling that dog. A cat mill, that is really dealing with where they put a small prey, whether it's a cat, whether it's a, a gerbil, whatever it may be, so that the dog can chase it. And that can give the physical agility and conditioning of that particular animal, as well as teaching it to go after prey. A breaking stick is what they use to stop um, prying dogs mouths open in order to stop them to break up a fight. So if you can see that's what a break, um, a breaking stick is. And a breeding stand is obviously to breed and sometimes they have to put the females in there because females are, are taught to um, kill males. And so if they, in order to breed them, they're going to have to force them to be in a position where it cannot try to chomp the male or bite the male when they're trying to breed these particular animals. This is a misdemeanor for the implementations. And it carries a fine of 90 days in jail and a fine not exceeding, a, um, I'm sorry, $5,000, just wanna make sure. Again, um, you can prohibit an, a, an individual from owning or possessing an animal. You can also do the psychological counseling um, as a part of the sentence or the penalties. And um, each implement though can be a separate charge. This is important because these implements are how I prove dog fighting. So if I, if we are executing a search warrant in a home and we are finding fighting pits, breeding sticks, syringes, if we find treadmills, because they use treadmills on dogs, why to condition them, right? So if we see all of these, items, these implements, and then you observe the animals and kind of their behavior, even though we may not visually be seeing a dog fight, we can do it circumstantially and saying there's no legitimate reason why you would have all of these things if you're not dog fighting or breeding to dog fight. Ten six zero eight is dealing with aggravated cruelty to animals, which is cockfighting. Um, I will tell you, this was something very interesting to me. I was able to prosecute successfully um, and disband two cockfighting operations in Montgomery County. And again, I grew up in Rockville. And when you think about cockfighting, I think more Tennessee or I think different areas. This is a very lucrative business and it is very lucrative um, in passing these animals across state lines and fighting in different um, jurisdictions. And in the last case that I did, I it was very interesting because I worked with the Virginia um, Task Force, which um, has an animal task force that I was able to meet individuals who went undercover in cockfighting rings for two years. Um, individuals who experts that would testify about the difference in poultry, um, which I, I was not well versed in. I became well versed in it, but it was really learning about the poultry business and show birds and and 
you know, what defenses are uh, into cockfighting, which is typically like, no, we have show birds. Um, we're not fighting anything. And in both of these cases, we did not have, you know, a ring of cockfighting where you actually were observing the cocks being fought. It was circumstantial. And one of the things that was circumstantial were the implementations. So as you can see, there are different types of implementations that we look for, and that is sparring muffs. Well, you say to myself, what is a sparring muff? And a, star, a sparring muff is where they cover the rooster spurs and they fight them. And that is where they fight them with their own cocks. So they're fighting each other, but they don't wanna hurt their own birds, right? So they do that in order to protect but to train them on how to fight. So that ultimately when they take the spurs off, um, they're gonna put things, or a sparring muff, when they take the sparring muffs off, they're gonna put things on like you see, which are the gaffs, the slashers, the postizas. And what those are is as you can see, they're, they're metal and they look like they have a hook. Well, they put them on the cocks like, and that's what they fight with. There have been individuals, owners, who have gotten slash, um, significantly hurt because of how sharp they were that the cock turned on them. Um, and this is obviously a part of the fighting. And people gamble on these animals of which, which bird is going to kill the other bird or destroy the other cock more. Um, this was just very interesting to me to learn. Um, I, when we shut down one of the operations, I was able to go and meet these birds. Um, they are not nice birds because they are trained to go after. And one of the things when we did a search warrant at one of the um, farms, for lack of a better term, that we took um, these cocks from, they put them in cages because you have to single cage them. You cannot put them together. And they put the cages together too close. And they tried to kill each other through the cages. So you can see by animal behaviors as well that that would be indicative of cockfighting. Um, we were able to successfully prosecute. But for cockfighting and for implements, the maximum penalty is three years in prison and a fine not exceeding $5,000. And again, we can do psychological counseling, um, prohibit a defendant from owning and possessing, as well as to participate in and pay for psychological. Why this is important is being able to confiscate these animals because a lot of money in cockfighting is what we call the bloodline. And that's the bloodline of these cocks because they want to breed them because they over years they become fighting birds. And so when we are able to remove these animals, then we're able to take away their ability to breed under that same bloodline. So this is my little girl, Callie. She's the queen of my world and she still lives in my house. And that's what she does on a daily basis. And she rules. She was um, owned by a previous owner who threw her out because she urinated in the wrong place. And one day she by accident got into our garage and we shut the garage, did not know she was in there and she survived for 30 days. Came out, fed her, made her a little place on our front porch. And one day I opened the door, she came in my house, went downstairs, went to the litter box, went to the litter box, used the litter box, got out, looked at me and never left my house. She is now my last surviving um, cat and she rules my world every day. So what do we do when we talk about investigations? Investigations for animal cruelty cases are extremely significant. And why are they significant? Because we have to be able to put together cases um, that I can prosecute. Um, one of the big tools that we do use is search warrants. And the purpose of the search warrant is to remove these animals that are being abused and neglected and save them if we can. Um, what we are finding now, unfortunately, is that with some of the new laws that have come into effect that 
we have tried to execute some search warrants with the police because the police um, go with our animal cruelty investigator as well as my vets go out on search warrants. And we are having people refuse to open the door and we can't force access. So they've had to walk away not being able to get these animals who need to be saved. Um, so that's a very frustrating point for me um, because I need these animals to get to a vet, to get healthy, to get out of their environment that they are currently in. So in the Office of Animal Services here in Montgomery County, we are extremely lucky that our director is Thomas Koenig, who is a wonderful human being that I have been dealing with um, for approximately the past six years. He came from Fairfax County Animal Cruelty, so he brings a lot of knowledge and he's just been phenomenal. Um, and we have an animal cruelty investigator whose name is Jack Breckenridge, who I've worked with closely through the years. So we work together on putting cases together in order that I can prosecute. So one of the things that they utilize is our state's attorney subpoenas. And that is to get records. So we can get records of animals from different vets. So if we need anything, any type of records, we're able to have the ability to subpoena um, those records so that I can get them together in order to prove my prosecution. Jack Breckenridge also does written statements. Um, he also does recorded interviews of suspects, of witnesses. Um, he does all my investigations. Um, I do go out with him. Um, I have been out recently in the past couple of weeks interviewing vets and witnesses on a significant case that we're about to charge. Um, and so we also have when the police go out, their body worn cameras, which are extremely helpful. We have 911 calls. We also have the animal services calls, which when you call animal services directly, they also have a recorded line. So these are all types of um, tools that we use. Photographs are incredible because a photograph is worth a thousand words sometimes in in animal prosecution, because sometimes I just want to put the photograph in and say state rest because there's nothing else that that I need to prove other than what's in that photo. This is Togo. This is my victim witness coordinators in my offices. Dog, adorable, one blue eye, one brown eye, so cute. Um, Expert witnesses. So this is one of the things that I found when I started prosecuting these cases that is a necessity. And that is that we are required to note expert witnesses and have expert witness testimony, which means that I have to have veterinarians come in on a consistent basis to testify regarding their examinations of these abused or neglected animals. And in some cases, when we do necropsies, which I stated earlier is the autopsy of an animal, we have to have the vet come in to testify about the necropsy. Um, because in those cases, that vet is formulating an opinion as to the cause of death of that particular animal. A lot of times these cases are emergencies. You know, we are trying to save animals' lives, so we have to take them to emergency vets as well as to our animal services. And in some cases, I would have to call four or five vets in a case, which can shut people's businesses down. Specifically in dealing with the emergency vets, right now, one of the cases I know I'm going to have to call for emergency vets because they all had something to deal with this particular animal that they would have to testify to. Um, so some of the things that I deal with that becomes hard is when vets do not want to cooperate and come to court. And without their cooperation and testimony, I can't prove my case. And an individual could go free or not be criminally prosecuted or found guilty because I can't get these vets to cooperate. I am extremely lucky here in Montgomery County that we have a chief vet, his name is Gregory Lawrence. He is one of the most kindest human beings, but he's a phenomenal vet. He works with me all the time, makes himself all, always available to come into court and testify. And we do have a second vet here in Montgomery County, which is Dr. Ramirez, who is also phenomenal. 
Um, they're very receptive. They work with me. They go out on search warrants. They help assess situations, you know, on their days off. Um, so they are extremely wonderful human beings. And I think we're extremely lucky here in Montgomery County. Um, but this is what we have to have to prove our cases. Um, so it, it can get a little bit difficult at times. So this is BJ. Um, I tried an individual and convicted them of neglect, uh, criminal neglect on him. So BJ was a canine. He's a beautiful German shepherd. And he was assigned to a particular individual um, as his canine handler in security, not in police, in security. Um, and that individual got fired, but they asked him to hold on to BJ until they could get a new handler. Well, he starved BJ. When we got BJ, BJ was 57 pounds. He's supposed to be 89 pounds. The pictures, you could see the rib cage and the back end and things of that nature. So I prosecuted him and that individual was convicted of um, animal cruelty against BJ. Um, and BJ ate, gained the weight back and was given back to his original owner where he is retired and living the life. I talked a little bit about the differences in the cases where we talked about misdemeanors and we talked about felonies. Why is that important to know? That case with BJ was a misdemeanor case. It did not rise to the level of an intentional act. I had to try that case in district court. What does that mean? That means that I have to file a motion to specially set these cases on a special date where I can be or receive the undivided attention of the judge for the entire day. Whereas normally in district court on a criminal docket, there could be 30, 40, 50 cases. Um, there's no way that I could try these particular cases because of the extensive nature of what I have to do in a very short period of time. These cases usually take me a day or longer to be able to prove. So we talked a little bit about kind of the sentencing and what is potentially out there for these cases. And I think that I think I saw somebody's face go, I can't, you know, facial expression of 90 days. Well, the other thing that we have to think about is kind of what is kind of behind this. So a lot of times we see a lot of mental health issues with some of these owners um, and that they truly believe that they, that they love their animals. And I don't doubt that, um, but that they are doing what is necessary for those animals. I can tell you that a lot of it we see is, we can see hoarding, we can see significant mental health issues um, in some of these cases. So if it's appropriate, sometimes we think about putting that individual in our mental health court. We see some individuals with significant substance abuse. We make sure that we try to fashion the appropriate disposition or sentence in these particular cases. Um, to help the individuals, obviously, and punish the individuals who have committed these offenses. Um, but the biggest thing that I focus on is making sure that they can not own, possess, or have any control over any animals. And that to me is extremely important because I want to make sure that I can save the next animal from being in that person's custody in the future. So some of the things that can happen is, is that they can be placed on probation. Um, with specific terms. And one of the terms I always ask for is no ownership of animals. They can go to jail. And in some cases, when it's appropriate, a, they can enter into what's called a stet, and that is to put, it on, put the case on an inactive docket for a period of time um, for that individual to, to do certain things, um, whether it's mental health treatment, um, or whether it is substance abuse treatment, but one of the common terms of that is no ownership or control over any animals. So coming to the end of this, I wanted to be able to show some of the cases that I have prosecuted in this office. Um, 
no pictures are bad, just so everybody knows I did not put up any of the bad pictures. So I want everybody to meet Steinway. Steinway is an orange male cat who was intentionally injured by an individual by the name of George Guthridge. George Guthridge was extremely mentally ill, but was staying at an individual's home, um, wanted to punish the owner. So he took Steinway through Steinway against the wall and broke its back to the point where Steinway was unable to defecate because he could not move the back portion of its body. Um, this is a personal picture I took of Steinway because I went to uh, meet Steinway in person at his owner's home. This defendant pled guilty to the felony aggravated animal cruelty. He was sentenced to three years suspended. He is doing 18 months of executed incarceration and he'll be placed on three years of supervised probation, including that he cannot own, possess, or be in control of any animals once he is released from jail. State versus Lance Williams, meet Bear, a Pomeranian mixed dog who was observed to have a large laceration. He was sliced in the back of the neck. This defendant had pled guilty to aggravated animal cruelty. He was received three years of incarceration. All of it was suspended and he was placed on five years of probation. One of the things about this particular case was that Mr. Williams was also charged with um, vulnerable abuse of an adult, which was his mother. Um, and Mr. Williams actually passed away last year, um, but his case was lengthy. Um, and one of the things that they had determined with him was mental health issues. And he was on a substance at the time that this had occurred that we were unable to determine exactly what it was. It probably was late marijuana laced with PCP. Um, when he committed the act against Bear, um, Bear is fine, um, and Bear was adopted. State versus James Jones, um, meet Mia and Chance. Mia and Chance were two six-week-old puppies that were being strangled by the neck um, on video um, in downtown Silver Spring outside of some restaurants. It was believed that the defendant was high on PCP at the time. Um, they could not, the police arrived, there were bystanders begging him to let go of these two beautiful um, six-week-old pup, pit bull puppies. Um, he would not, it took multiple um, tasers and, and to get him to relinquish the dogs. One of the officers on scene who is seen on video is giving um, Chance, which is the golden mouth-to-mouth um, -mouth resuscitation while they were waiting for animal services to get on scene. It was because of that officer that uh, Chance survived. Um, and they were immediately transported uh, to an emergency vet where they were saved. Um, Chance was ended up being adopted by that officer um, and Mia was adopted by another individual. Uh, the defendant in this case pled guilty to the felony aggravated animal cruelty, and he received six months of executed incarceration in jail, as well as was placed on five years of probation. The feel good part about this story is, is that Chance and his mama were at a park in Gaithersburg, and it was a dog park. And there was another dog that was there, and Chance kept wanting to play with it. Well, come to find out, it was Mia. And as you can see the picture at the bottom, they now have regular play dates um, from the two owners. So by happenstance, they came in contact again and they are doing phenomenal. State versus Scorpio Stanfield. Um, this was a domestic violence issue and case. And unfortunately we see this a lot in animal cruelty cases. This is Layla and Layla was murdered by Scorpio Stanfield. And he, she was murdered um, because the woman that he was dating at the time would not obey what he wanted and was not listening and she was trying to get away and he murdered her dog, Layla. Um, he received one year of executed incarceration and when he was released was to be placed on two years of probation. And lastly, the state versus Herbert Green. This is Benji. This is a poodle mixed type dog. And as you can see, this was a, the intake 
photo at our animal services um, when Benji was taken in. This defendant pled guilty to one count of aggravated animal cruelty. He was sentenced to three years incarceration, but it was suspended and placed on five years of probation. This particular defendant was um, over the age of 70, was caring for this dog for the owner. And apparently the dog was not cooperating, so it decided to smash it on its head to the point where the dog is now blind. Um, the dog uh, needed an extensive amount of care and our director took this dog and fostered this dog through this process, making sure that Benji was taken care of and received the appropriate veterinary care while this criminal case was going on. I appreciate everybody for being here. Um, thank you for caring for our animals. This is um, Mr. McCarthy's email and phone number if you have any questions, my email and phone number. And I did put at the bottom the Office of Animal Services telephone number. Um, if there's any questions, you can always feel free to reach out to us or to Animal Services and I'm always happy here to help.